Hey there, the Games Apprentice back with another Evercade video. This week I'm going to be reviewing the Commodore 64 Collection 1. Is it a quality collection, or is it just very basic? Let's find out. The Commodore 64 was first released in January 1982 and went on to become a Guinness World Record holder as the best-selling single model desktop computer. Throughout its lifetime, it played host to a wide variety of classic games and launched the careers of numerous legendary game designers, many of whom got their start programming in the built-in basic coding language on the C64. While many 80s gaming enthusiasts grew up with the 8-bit home consoles, others spent their formative years enjoying the Commodore 64's distinctive breed of computer games. With this Evercade collection, it's time to explore or rediscover exactly what the old beige bread bin had to offer. So this is a collection I've been looking forward to for a while. I never had a Commodore 64. I may have played one at a friend's as a kid, but I don't really remember it. So all the games on here are completely new to me. I may have heard of them vaguely, but I've definitely never played any of them. The manual for this one is a bit more extended than previous collections, but it really has to be. Impossible Mission, Summer Games and Winter Games all get a four page spread to tell you a bit more about the games and how to play them. Without this you'd have no hope for the Winter Games and Summer Games. It also comes with this decoder. This is a neat little addition, as if you were born before the mid 1980s you'll remember that these came with games to prevent piracy. This particular one however, is for this extra bonus game. Gribbler's Day Out is a pretty terrible platformer. I'm not going to include it in the rankings as it's free, just go into the secrets menu and type in Gribbly Grobbly. The music is pretty cool, it plays a bit like Flappy Bird or something, you can fly around but gravity is always pulling you down a bit. Quite like the controls, but the level design is awful. I assume there's other levels, but I couldn't get past the first one, and after a couple of attempts I definitely didn't want to keep trying. You've got to fly, bounce around and collect these little things. I wasn't quite sure where you were supposed to take them, but pretty much everything kills you when you're flying around. The background, random objects. It's like someone decided to make a game out of the infamous Underwater Turtles level on the NES. So that was the bonus game. The actual cat itself comes with 14 games. Here they are ranked from worst to best. Number 14, the movie monster game. In this game, you pick a monster, a city and a scenario, and then smash lots of stuff up with your laser eyes or fire breathing. It's a shame that this comes last, as it does have some stuff going for it. The premise is sort of cool, it's supposed to be a movie, so you get the audience in the movie theatre and the curtain opening. However, this is a double-edged sword, as all this just takes up extra time, and you have to sit through it every single time. On some levels, this actually takes up more time than playing the game takes. Usually if you die, you'd want to jump straight back in, but this extra time just makes it off-putting. It also has this horrible flickering screen before and after the game start. I'm sure this is something to do with the emulation, as it occasionally popped up in other games, but it's incredibly annoying. If the gameplay was great, this could be overlooked, but it's not. Your character movement is incredibly slow, especially when moving up and down. Launching your attack seems to take an age, and none of it is particularly satisfying or fun. Once you're over the initial excitement from the theme of the game, there's not really any fun to be had here. Number 13, Lee. Lee is basically a beat em up. You can jump, punch and do fly kicks, as well as slowly climb and even more slowly fall. The fly kicks are quite satisfying, but that's pretty much where the compliments of this game die. It's slow, it's dull, you just fight the same two enemies over and over. I was quite excited when I first started this one, as I quite like the controls, but it just becomes so dull so fast. Number 12, Stormlord. Stormlord is basically just a really poor action platform game. You can jump and shoot. It's not clear what objects are dangerous, part of the background, actual enemies or collectibles. Movement is incredibly slow, which has become a theme on this cat. It's got a fun little animation when you get catapulted from the sky, but that's the only compliment I've got for this one. I mean, look at this. I'm just standing in midair. This is literally within about 30 seconds of the first level, probably less than that. Games are supposed to be fun, this one just feels like a chore to play. Number 11, Alley Cat. Alley Cat is a shoot em up where you're a ship that can shoot and fly under object. I checked my notes for this one and all I wrote is, it's a bit shit. 
which to be fair sums it up pretty well, but I'll go into a little more detail. Enemies come from behind you at high speed, and you've only got an inch in which to see them coming. If you take a hit when you're flashing, you die. As well as watching out for enemies from behind you, you're also watching out for objects in front of you, and try to look at shadows to figure out if you can go under the objects or if you need to avoid them. This is fine at first, but as speed picks up, it's nearly impossible to tell what objects you can go under and what you can't. It's meant to be a shoot em up, but honestly, shooting anything is the least of your concerns. It's just about surviving everything this game quickly throws at you. The game also has the letters G and E on the floor, which are pickups. Not remotely clear what they do, as there's no HUD or anything, and nothing obvious happens on the screen. They're probably points, but you don't find out your score until the end of the game. So yeah, it's a bit shit. Number 10, Iridis Alpha. Not to be confused with Marvel and Luther actor, another shoot em up, this time a side scrolling one, and for this one my note simply said WTF. Again, I personally think that sums up this game perfectly, but here's a little bit more of what I could figure out. So while the last game didn't have a HUD, this game went absolutely overboard with it. There's so much on the screen and very little of it is the actual game. The gameplay all takes place in the top third of the screen. The middle of the screen just seems to be a picture of your ship chilling out, and the bottom third of the screen looks like some sort of insane riddle. It's just instantly not a good look. The gameplay itself is okay, you can fly in all directions and shoot stuff. When the ships explode they turn into circles that you're supposed to fly into. At one point you turn into like an alien with legs for some reason. All oh, these faces just fly at you and you can barely seem to avoid them, making the screen flash and stopping you moving. Once you've been killed, you get a game over screen that needs no explanation. Okay then. Still unlike previous games that I've talked about, as bad as this game is, the insanity of it left me wanting to go back and play some more. Unfortunately though, that's where things got even worse for this game, as it suddenly just stopped wanting to load on my Evercade Versus. It works fine on the handheld, but the Versus version just stopped working. Hopefully that'll get patched, although I'm not going to lose sleep over it. Number 9, Jumpman. Jumpman was the original name of Super Mario, this game has got nothing to do with that. It plays a bit like an arcade platformer, something like Donkey Kong, which Mario's in. You can climb up and down ladders, and you can jump, man. It's pretty rubbish. The fact that when exiting ladders, you've got to be pixel perfect with the floor. The funeral march song when you die is the best part of the game, and sums up the game quite well. It's playable, it's not good, and there's so many more good arcade games on the Evercade. Still, it exists. You can't deny that. Number 8, Subterranea. Another side scrolling shooter now, and this one feels a little more unique, although it's a bit like Alley Cat, which I guess instantly makes it not that unique. You're more interested in shooting obstacles instead of enemies. Enemies increase your score, but they're not a big threat. Walls are the biggest threat in this one. Some you blast through, some you need to shoot a button to open, and others are just above and below you creating a difficult passage. The ship handling isn't very good, and it's definitely not good enough for this sort of game. You can't fly to the exact set of pixels you need to visibly clear an obstacle. Graphically, it's a bit different. Levels are all just one bland colour, and any actual colour seems to be reserved for the enemies. There's a bit of sound effects, but none of it feels particularly satisfying, and sound effects from music are one of the most important parts of any good shoot em up. Navigating levels is fun, shooting isn't, which is the other most important part of a shoot em up. Number 7, Marauder. Yet another shoot em up. In this one, you're like a little buggy and you shoot at nonsense. You can shoot in all directions, but only in the direction you're facing. This is where modern twin stick shooters improve on this genre so much. Having to position yourself in the right place to get a shot away whilst also avoiding being shot yourself is really difficult. It doesn't help that the hitbox on your buggy is massive. You think you've got time to avoid a bullet, or that you're out of the way enough, but nope, you're not. I mentioned how important sound effects are in shoot 'em ups. This has none. They decided to go for the choice of pure music instead. The music is really good, but it just doesn't fit the genre. It feels like something that should be an adventure game rather than this. This is a very hard game, and it's not really worth it. Number 6, Gateway to Apshai. I guess the most obvious mainstream comparison for this game is The Legend of Zelda. You need to work your way through a dungeon, fighting enemies, and picking up treasures. This is probably the first game on the list that I actually liked. 
It's a fun adventure game, but it's one that isn't without its problems. There's a lot of walking around, and walking left to right with your weird limp is painfully slow. You can pick up items on the floor, but only if you walk through them in a certain direction and perfectly. You've got a few different actions you can do, but they're not in a menu or mapped to a button. You've instead got to scroll through all the actions, and you can only scroll in one direction, so if you miss it, you've got to start over. It's not a bad game, but yeah, it's not great. Number 5, Battle Valley. This one's quite an interesting shooter. You've got tanks and helicopters. Depending what button you press decides which one you pick. And using the tank you can clear out the anti-air stuff that's hard to avoid in a helicopter, whilst a helicopter can get to areas that the tank can't. You can move in both directions and you can shoot. Annoyingly, if you tap shoot twice quickly, your vehicle turns and faces you. I guess this is to let you know that you're not meant to waste ammo as it's limited, but shooting is so difficult that without a double shot, you're screwed. Luckily, you can turn this off in the options before the game starts. It's an interesting concept, but unfortunately, when you lose, you get a screen telling you that the Holocaust has destroyed the world, which is troubling to say the least. Number 4 Street Sports Baseball. One of the best things about this game is the box art photo. What a picture to entice people. This is basically how I imagine it was in the US in the 80s. A bunch of diverse people would all be hanging out on some steps outside of a building and you'd be like, hey guys, let's play ball. Once you've answered a seemingly endless amount of questions to get started, this game's a pretty simple baseball game. You get two views when batting. The right view is overhead, making it much easier to tell when you're supposed to swing for the ball and how far your bat reaches. Like all baseball games, batting is just about timing. When throwing, you can throw straight or you can add a curve on the D-pad. I played a lot of baseball games growing up, mainly Hardball 3 on the Sega Mega Drive. Obviously this doesn't have the depth of something like that, but it's fine as far as baseball mechanics go. Its main issue is just that it, everything is so slow. The AI can take an age to pitch, and everyone just moves around like they're walking through treacle or something. It's just slow, slow, slow. Number 3, Winter Games. I don't know why this genre died off so much, but back in the 80s and 90s, Olympic and Winter Olympic games are really popular. At least they were in my house. I guess the main appeal was the variation. So many games back then were repetitive and people didn't have many, so anything that gives you a bit of variety in the gameplay was welcome. Winter Games is a decent one. Graphically, it looks pretty good for the Commodore 64, and it's got a fun few events. The biathlon is probably my favourite, although it does go on a little too long. In this one you've got to do some cross-country skiing and then a bit of shooting and gun reloading. It's tough to go fast and it's all about rhythm and timing. Figure skating is probably the dullest, which is a shame as it takes up two of the events and I just couldn't get the hang of the bobsleigh at all. Make sure you pick a country with the least annoying national anthem, as if you play alone you'll be hearing it after every event. It's a shame there's no world record score to try and beat, because you basically either need to play multiplayer or you're just playing against yourself. Number 2, Summer Games. Coming out a year before its sequel, the aforementioned Winter Games, this one is definitely the better of the two, and to be honest, it's not close. This one's got all the classics that were in many Olympic game collection, and it offers a good variation. There's not really any duds either, they're all fun in their own way. My personal favourite was skeet shooting, which I'd not seen in an Olympic game before, and like every Olympic game ever, I could not get the hang of the pole vault. A lot of the racing doesn't involve beating the shit out of your control pad too, which is nice. It tends to be more timing based rather than speed, although there is one event where you do have to hammer left and right on your d-pad, which doesn't work great on the Evercade. The same complaints from the previous game apply, but it's still a decent game. Number 1, Impossible Mission. This week's number 1 spot and Evercade Gem of the Week is Impossible Mission. I'm not sure how well known this one is, this is the only game on the list that I'd heard of, but only because I'd seen it amongst a bunch of NES ROMs. I didn't know anything about it beyond that and I've definitely never played it. It's got a sequel, so it must have been reasonably popular. It's basically a sort of Metroidvania platform game I guess. You've got a map that leads to different puzzle rooms, you can do a flip, and also search objects within levels. You basically need to make your way through, finding clues and passwords while avoiding the robots. 
if you take a hit you die but you don't have lives so it just puts you back at the start of that puzzle and it leaves the room where you left it it's a very forgiving game for something like this which is great it means you can just enjoy it the sweet flip jump is satisfying the puzzles are fun and i just wanted to see more of the game overall if these are the best games on the Commodore 64, then I really don't think I missed out on anything not having one, and I certainly don't regret my decision not to get the Commodore 64 Mini that came out a few years ago. One of my friends told me that they asked for a Sega Master System as a kid, and their parents instead bought them the Commodore 64, and at the time I didn't really think of anything of it, but now I feel like I should call the NSPCC and report their parents because that is cruel. As much as I liked Impossible Mission, so much on this car is just garbage, and the fact that the number 4 position goes to a baseball game that isn't really very good tells you what you're dealing with with this car. So sorry Commodore 64 fans, but this is probably the worst ever kid cartridge that I've played so far. For that reason, I'm going to give this one a 3 out of 10. Thanks for watching, don't forget to click subscribe, and I'll catch you next time with another Evercade review. Until then, retro fans.